welcome. Um, and we're here today at a panel that will change the world for every human being. It's hard to say that about the 200 sessions at the Global Conference this year. But really, it's precision medicine accelerating treatments from potential to reality. And we often step back and say, what are some of the greatest achievements in history? And when you're going to school, whether it was the invention of the wheel, development of agriculture, the printing press to share ideas, and other revolutions, the industrial and technology revolutions. But for us, we have to keep reminding ourselves it's really the extension of life. This amazing thing that's really occurred in the last 114, 115 years. And when you step back and think about evolution, four million years, four million years of evolution produced 11-year increase in average life expectancy. And so by 1900, average life expectancy was 31 on planet Earth. 114 years later, average life expectancy is 71. And this is why we're constantly focused on the fact that the number one driver of economic growth in the world has been medical research, public health, sanitation, et cetera. And we are entering this period, a period of big data, of medical information being digitized, that will be known as the golden age of medicine, precision medicine, immunology, and so on. And luckily, we are here today with four of the leaders in the world in this area. And in, uh, I should say five of the leaders, because to my left is Margaret Anderson, who runs Faster Cures in Washington, D.C. Margaret, could you introduce the panelists to us? Absolutely. So to my left is Pradeep Kosla, who's the chancellor of the University of California, San Diego. Um, I, I want to reiterate what Mike said, which is that we have just a powerhouse group here to help you in the audience understand how unique this moment in time is and really what to expect going forward. So they're going to be sharing with us their insights about the future, not just for the individual patient, but for uh, the future of training physician scientists. Um, I think the man to my right needs no further introduction, Mike Milken, who brought us all here and really has been powering forward in all of these areas and really wants all of you to understand what's possible and what do we need to get there. Um, Next, we have Brian Drucker, who is the director at Oregon's Health and Science University um, and has, you know, just a long, illustrious career that we're going to hear about in terms of how did we do precision medicine back in the day, how are we doing it today, and then where are we headed. Um, next, we have Betsy Nabel, and Elizabeth Nabel, she is the president of Br Brigham and Women's Healthcare. Uh, and has a long career in uh, cardiovascular research and science as well. Um, and then last but not least, Sam Hoggood, Chancellor of the University of California, San Francisco, and UCSF really has been pioneering some amazing models of taking all of the, the pieces that we're going to talk about in today's panel, um, applying them uh, in a different way, and thinking about the future. Mike, do you want to take it away from here? And Mike and I are going to kind of co-share this responsibility. So today. let's take a look at uh, the slide on cost of sequencing. And the fundamental thing that's occurred is the speed that that data can be sent at, the cost that it can be processed, and the cost of storage. So as we start to think about files, trillions of data, being able to move at a speed that you're not even noticing how long it takes to move, the cost of storage going to zero. This has totally changed our opportunity. And one of the things we want to stress today is that bioscience is more than just health. So this panel is primarily focused on health. But this investment in data and knowledge 
will help us in food and clean water, defense, bioterrorism, energy, environment, et cetera. So whatever we're going to discuss today, you can project to other areas. And with that, Margaret, why don't we get started? Absolutely. Pradeep, I'd like you to go first. If you could tell us a little bit about the road to precision medicine, what do you think the, the keys are to the kingdom? So let me start by that first slide that uh, Michael showed, which was uh, great inventions uh, in humanity. And there's one thing missing out there. It's actually embedded in there. It's the transistor. Without the transistor, there is no IT, there is no integrated circuit, there is nothing of what we see today. All the wealth we have created does not exist. That is by far one of the most significant uh, inventions. And the reason I bring this out... Pradeep, just one second. If you'll notice... In tech revolution, I saw thank that. Thank you. <laughs> I, saw that. I said it's implicit, it's not explicit. <laughs> Mike, Mike, Mike listened to the instructions, which was we wanted it to be interactive. So thank you, Mike, for That's modeling. right. So the reason I point this out is because I think the road to precision medicine goes through big data in ways that one cannot imagine. And big data is not just collecting more and more data. Big data is also the ability to bring artificial intelligence to bear on this data and to create, uh, uh, make decisions out of this data that are not quite obvious just by looking at the data. They're not just linear interpolations or curve fitting type of decisions. So I think that is really a very big deal. And the reason I point this out is because right now, most academic programs don't quite emphasize data science the way we should be emphasizing. And I think the future of medical education is going to change, too, because the doctors will have to understand a lot more of the clinicians and the scientists. Pradeep, the, the beauty of what you're talking about in terms of big data is it really brings together an amazing team of individuals, experts in mathematics, right. computational biology, engineers, physicists, with biomedical researchers, with physicians, with clin clinicians. And when you think about it, these are collisions of collaboration mm -hmm. as, a, as a way to think about it. And it's a way in which the science, the technology, and the medical care is really going to move forward. So I wonder if one of the great achievements is, is simply the, the collisions of collaboration that are going to occur between so many disparate groups that are going to need to work together in our society. And Betsy, can you talk for a minute about that, uh, the, you know, that evolution of collaboration? Because uh, science hasn't always worked that way or been incented that way. Can no, you speak no. to those drivers and how we no, can change them? No, we, we, uh, we scientists are, are well known for working within our vertical silos. Uh, and thinking about our turf and, and you know, what we're going to do on a small scale. But the world has completely changed. Uh, and I actually think it's the social connectivity uh, and it's our younger generation as we're bringing them up in science that are really educating and changing those of us who grew up in those vertical silos. There's no doubt that for us to be successful going forward, we have to work horizontally across sectors across countries in ways that we haven't, th haven't thought about. And I do think the social connectivity is going to be a, a tremendous driver for us. I think what, what both Pradeep and Betsy are saying is science has become a team sport. Right. And, and back when I developed the drug Gleevec, it was myself in a lab and a drug company, and that was it. But now when we've brought together teams that are doing drug development, we're bringing computational biologists and engineers and physicists and scientists and medical physicians and a sequencing company. So we're bringing together large numbers of, of disparate expertise to move things quicker. And so it's no longer just an individual scientist yeah. or an individual company working. It's large teams working together. And we have to find ways to incentivize that. But Brian, one thing has remained constant. And you have talked about this before in terms of the quest for uh, the drug Gleevec, and that is the patient. So you've talked about the devastation that uh, CML leukemia, you know, kind of wreaked on that patient population, and then you saw the evolution. So has that role been shifting as well? What I've always said, Margaret, is we, we have to put the patients first. We have a problem. We need to solve the problem. We need to focus on how to solve that problem quickly. And just to give you an example, you know, when I was, I was there at the birth of precision medicine, and I was there when, when it wasn't even a word, and I had a, I'm fortunate that I'm both a scientist and a doctor, and I see patients. And I had a patient come to me in the early trials of Gleevec who basically had been told she had weeks to live. 
She had picked out her burial site. She had picked out the music for her funeral. She started on her clinical trials of Gleevec in February 2000, and six weeks later, they have a picture of her with a cheesecake smile lying on her grave site. And she's still here with us 15 years later. And she'd been told she had weeks to live. That's what we can accomplish if we understand what's driving the growth of a cancer and target it specifically. And that was really the birth of precision medicine. Ryan, I think it would be helpful. How does Gleevec work? Let's talk about that. So thank you, Michael. The, the way that Gleevec works is there was 25 years of medical research that identified a target. And basically, it was like understanding the shape of a lock and designing a key to fit in and turn, turn, the, turn the ignition off. And that's exactly what we did with the drug company. We knew what the target was. We knew what the lock looked like. We designed a key to get in there and shut it off. And what we developed was a drug that basically, in a phase one, first in human trial, by the time we reached effective dose, had a 100% response rate. It got FDA approval in two and a half years from our start of clinical trials. And it really established this paradigm of precision medicine. But moving forward, that was 20 years ago. And moving forward, we can now understand with the sequencing of genomes what those locks look like very quickly. Right. And if we can move beyond the genome and incorporate additional information, we can actually begin to design drugs very quickly and move them through the pipeline of clinical trials very quickly. So, so Sam, I want you the, to be able to jump in. Yeah, a build on the uh, comment about where the, where the patient fits in, in this. And I think uh, precision medicine, just the terminology makes it sound very technical, as if you're somehow removing from the patient. It's exactly the opposite. For precision medicine to work, um, the patients are going to have to uh, be an a, a, a very active partner with the scientists and clinicians to make this work in a way that has not occurred in the past. It's going to be a movement away from the sort of paternalism of, of medicine to a real partnership with patients. Because I think some of the tools that technology is bringing, some of the digital health devices and other things, uh, meaning that uh, the, the contribution of a patient and the interaction with the clinician is no longer going to be every six months come back for a checkup, or we're doing a clinical trial on a new drug and it means you've got to go to a destination place to have a major workup every three months. Now that it can all be local and at home and in a mobile space. So uh, we have to build a very different kind of relationship with, with patients. And then the, the last point on the patients is uh, we are going to have to build a tremendous level of trust because precision medicine is built on big data. That means sharing of data, sharing of very personal data. Uh, and uh, Sharing of big data does not have a great name right now with the, the security breaches, et cetera. So we're going to have to work very hard to build the trust of patients for them to become very active partners and advocates for precision medicine. But I do think it's interesting. So uh, you're clearly talking about security breaches and data. But Mike, what's the statistic that I've heard you quote about Facebook users? <laughs> well, we have, sur we have surveyed numerous people with life-threatening diseases. <clears throat> More than 70% in every case would be willing to make that data available if it would help them, help their family, and help others. So quite often, as you know, we're protecting people that don't want to be protected. And you know, it's no longer shocking to see a person on a talk show tell you every deep, dark secret or 600 million people going to Facebook, telling anyone that's following them what's happening in their personal life. So, Sam, I think that trust element is there. But it's also an element here. If I have a life-threatening disease, uh, we have, as you think about it, protected people who have terminal diseases from taking something that might be harmful to their health. So, I mean, it's a it's a decision we, unfortunately, are forced in the world we live in today to send 20-year-olds with great futures, et cetera, into combat, where we've substantially increased their chance of being injured or even killed. Yeah. So I think there's somewhat of a trade-off on this data. And what we're learning from the social media 
is that people are willing to share maybe substantially more information than we think they are. So, Mike, can I add something? So I think we are not trying to keep the data secret from other people. I think we are trying to make sure that the insurance companies don't use that data to deny insurance and put somebody in a more difficult situation. Because the future, I think, is going to be crowdsourcing discoveries. If you think about this big data, and if you think about the smartest people in the world, they are not all sitting at San Diego or San Francisco or Berkeley. They're all over the world. Crowdsourcing discoveries, opening this database up, and crowdsourcing, the ability, letting people dig into it and create discoveries, create therapies, I think is going to be the future. That's going to lead to new IP uh, regulations. It's going to lead to a different way of looking at what security of this data is. Pradeep, you're right. But for us to be successful in precision medicine, it's going to require significant investments and significant interaction between the public and private sector. Uh, you've all heard about President Obama's announcement that the uh, NIH will go forward with a precision medicine initiative, which is terrific, but it's $215 million. Uh, it will go to fund a cancer cohort and probably embellish some of the existing uh, cohorts at the NIH that I had responsibility for when I uh, directed the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. That's terrific. But... 215 million is probably 10 to the 3, 10 <laughs> to the 5 less of what we really need. And what we really need is investment from the private sector to come in and co-invest with leaders, scientists, physicians um, to bring a number of these technologies, diverse technologies, forward and then bring them to coalesce in, in a way that ultimately is going to serve but, us as individuals and patients. Betsy, aren't you talking about a new form of collaboration to achieve these incredibly big, powerful goals? And I, I'm wondering if we need to reframe uh, the way we speak about this. Oh, that's not enough investment from the feds to what you're getting to, which is we need to leverage capital and we need to have a multiple Absolutely, stakeholders. Margaret. And I, I, I can cite the Massachusetts uh, experience. Um, at my particular hospital and the Mass General Hospital, we're partners healthcare. Um, it used to be that federal funding constituted 60, 65, maybe 70 percent of our research portfolio. It's now 40 percent, and it, it is gradually declining. And the rest has been built out by, by investments from the private sector, whether it be pharma, biotech, venture capital. And as we say, we're open for business. We have had to completely turn around our tech transfer and other components of our hospital systems to really make research collaborations with private investors very, very simple. Yesterday, for example, um, I spoke at an um, annual meeting of, of an investment firm that brought in 50 of their investors, and we talked all about digital health care and the opportunities for digital healthcare, which marry quite nicely with precision medicine. But it's a, it's a new way of thinking that certainly for us at universities and academic medical centers uh, really are rethinking about how we invest with you in the future of biomedical yeah. research. Betsy, philanthropy plays a very important role too, right? And so what's the Absolutely. percentage of philanthropy? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, well, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, philanthropy is a whole different pot of money for, for us is the way that we <laughs> so look at it. Take a look there. here. You'll see philanthropy is a very small part, but it's the venture funding. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And it's that 3% that gets it going. And I think one of the issues that was addressed here is that, Pradeep, you talked about this being worldwide. The U.S. has no monopoly on breakthroughs. <laughs> and if you start to take a look at where some of these things have occurred, whether it was penicillin or statins, etc., they've occurred throughout the world. And if you step back and say, okay, those countries that are the leaders in bioscience will be the leaders in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. This is the language of the 21st century. And we're looking at these different commitments that have been made in growth rates, where China has now committed $1.9 trillion. Is this government funding, Michael? Yes, yes. $1.9 trillion over the next 10, 12 years on this 12, five-year plan. If we go back and look 
at the rate of change, you can see that the United States has dropped as where as China, India. And what's interesting is with many of the similar problems of the United States, the UK actually continued to grow their funding. And as a result, it's not a surprise that one out of every four of the 20 leading bioscience academic universities are now in the UK. So, Margaret, I know you moderated a panel earlier today, uh, earlier this week, on the subject of changes in technology, et cetera. So, absolutely. So we would like to play a clip from the panel, Healthcare in the Digital Age, that I think some of you may have attended. Uh, in, in that clip, first, Dr. Anna Barker, uh, formerly of the National Cancer Institute, now she's at ASU, um, systems thinker. She talks about different ways that we've learned to think about disease. And then Patrick Soon Shang talks about new challenges for physicians, which I know is a uh, kind of a common thread amongst the panelists here is how do we take the way that we're training physicians and scientists today and launch them to the future? So if you could play that tape, I'd like the panelists to comment on some of these themes. Thinking back to 2003, which you may or may not remember was the completion of the sequencing of the human genome, which at the time everyone said would probably be the discovery of our time, and I think that's proving to be the case. So since 2003, we have figured out that um, disease is really information. It's digital information. So Brian, I think what's exciting is that the future is actually here it just needs the courage of the medical community to actually adopt it. The challenge, I think, the biggest challenge, I've been asked this by the American Medical Association, what is the biggest challenge now for the advancement of 21st century care? And I think, sadly, the biggest challenge is dogma. We have to actually unlearn everything that we've learned before, because we as physicians <coughs> have been trained to understand diseases from an organ state. So you're a breast cancer specialist and you're a lung cancer specialist. For the first time, we can now understand de diseases at the cellular state. And if you look at cancer, they don't care which organ they're in. If you have a cellular uh, uh, biology that's happening, whether it's in lung or breast, the same drug could apply even a non-cancer drug, which is called repurposed. Brian, can you yeah. kick us off on that uh, theme? What do you think about what was just said, and, and how do you see that going forward? Well, I want to address two points in there, if I might. First, I want to address the issue of, of sharing of big data, which was one of the issues. And one of the things that we've done is a huge collaboration with Intel, which has our largest workforce in our backyard in Oregon, to try to understand how we can allow data to stay at the Brigham or UCSF or UC San Diego but anybody in the world can access that data. So you store your data, you can keep it behind your <coughs> private firewall, you can protect it however you want, but me sitting in my clinic with a patient, I can say, well, I have a patient with these genetic features and these proteomic whatever features, I can enter my computer and I can ask the world, what's happened to patients like that, and then I can design a treatment. That's what we're trying to create with an in industry investment in, in our institution but it goes beyond our walls. The other point I'd, I'd pick up on is Patrick's, which is how we define disease or cancer. And the way I've explained it is, you, if you drive a Ford or a Chevy or a Mercedes, when you go to the mechanic, the mechanic doesn't say, well, your Ford's broken, so I'm gonna replace this part. They lift up the hood, and guess what? The engine in the Ford is the, pretty much the same as it is in the Mercedes. They look at what part's broken, and that's how they decide how to fix it. Well, that's how we're gonna fix all diseases. When we think about cancer, Gleevec, the drug I discovered, works for 10 different cancers. And it does that because we look inside the cell. We see what part's breaking. That's like lifting up the hood of the car. We understand what's broken and then we can fix it. But that's gonna require huge amounts of data to bring to bear on these problems. To build on Brian's point about uh, digital healthcare, each of us at our hospitals are gathering data repositories where our patients, we have electronic medical records and we have a lot of information about our, our patients. They're 
diagnoses, their clinical course, their EKGs, their pulmonary function tests, uh, all of their laboratory findings. Uh, and we may have a repository of, of say, 25, 50,000 individuals. But for precision medicine to really take hold and be, to be useful, you're a physician sitting across from an individual in a rural setting, in an urban setting, in the United States, across the world. You want to be able to access the information and the experience that's been aggregated across all of these different hospitals and health systems, at least in the United States. And that's where a couple things come into play. That's where we, we need the large data sets. We need the computational analytics. We need the cooperativity between all of us that we're going to share that data in an anonymized way so that at the end of the day, no matter where you are as an individual, you have access to the best data to make the best decisions about your own health care. So I have to admit that these conversations used to um, sort of mystify me because I would think, you know, I just don't see this happening. Mike, when I first joined Faster Cures, used to say, I'll put my medical records on the internet and I'll show people how I'm willing to share, everybody should be sharing, and I, I just couldn't see how it would work. Now we're having a conversation today that looks dramatically different, mm -hmm. and you're all talking about the need to put these data sets together, but is there um, any, are there forces at work that are still trying to hold us back, and if so, what are they, and how do we uh, sort of steamroll over them? So, go ahead, Sam. Uh, I, I think there are some, uh, uh technical challenges as well as political challenges. The technical challenges are that we have not, as we've grown into this uh, technical uh, generation of medicine, we've not done it together. We've all done it from the bottom up. So there's not great standardization of, of data. You know, my shortness of breath is your dyspnea. And so there's, there's just a, a technical challenge that artificial intelligence and other approaches to non-structured data, I think, will be enormously helpful. Um, to bring this data together. And then I, I, I think there still is a fear. I, I take what Mike said, um, but I think we still have not, as a, as a uh, discipline, made the case strongly enough of the huge value add to the everyday citizen for, for doing this. And, and w the case can be made. We, we need to articulate the value. Well, Sam, why don't you make that patient. case right now? Well, I think Brian said it beautifully when he described the... Uh, I, I, I'm sitting at, I'm, as a, as a frontline clinician, I'm sitting there with, a, with an unusual patient who has a, has a problem and you can go on to a database and instead of relying on your experience, you know, the six patients that you've personally seen or the experience of the two or three colleagues that you can pick up the phone and talk to, you can get the experience of California, you can get the experience of the US, or you could get the experience of the world, ultimately, can if I we can solve yeah. this problem. To the dilemma that it creates, I think there's a big ethical issue coming up, which is if everything was public, then we could go to what Brian was saying. But I think this data asset, the data that we are talking about is going to be significant, uh, significantly priced asset. So to the investor, it's going to look like, oh, I have a lot of data that's worth a lot of money. So now herein lies the problem where you have all of this data that you think is worth a lot of money and you want to monetize the asset, but the doctor like Brian may not have access to that data. It's like LexisNexis, the database. You know, some of us have access, others don't. So I think this is going to be an issue that one has to deal with as to where does this data sit and how does one access it and who pays and how much. You know, so, so, you know one of the things that, that has been remarkable about the collaboration with Intel is that Intel doesn't talk about monetizing the data. Yet. What, no, but, but what they recognize... <laughs> no, this but, is what... what but, but what they recognize <laughs> is that if you've got the data out there, there's apps to be built right. it's on the top of it's that. It's the application on amount, top. Yes. On the top of that. The data yeah. itself. And, what they, and they'll helpful. certainly sell I, plenty I, of chips. I, they, I think one can learn from social networking and crowdsourcing. All of the data, the Internet of Things that we were talking about that was being accessed, that was being uh, generated, we thought was going to be free. And, uh, but companies right now are sitting on those and on that data and trying to monetize every little bit of it. So don't confuse between well, 10 I, years I, ago. Well, I think, Pradeep, the, the way that you can think about the monetization, for example, we, we have a number of collaborations with Google Ventures. And we now are doing clinical trials with Google Ventures. 
So a way to monetize this is a pharmaceutical company may want to have access to the data as they think about developing a particular target. I think it's not unreasonable to pay a licensing fee to yeah. access that as part of your R&D. I'm not saying it should be but, free, but... <laughs> but, but so I think I'm gonna, there are so, some models. I'm calling in a lifeline here. I, I have to know someone <laughs> who, who knows a few things about yeah. this. There are some models we can look at. As a student at Berkeley, when I questioned the theories on credit that people had relied on for hundreds of years, there were data sets that I could access free as a student. We are talking in this case of such large files and data. What's exciting is that as that student at Berkeley 50 years ago, I could access the whole history of trading etc. It, it was managed by the University of Chicago. We never had these sets in medicine. You, it cost 100 million, 50 million, whatever to create. One of the great data sets was what happened to the Union soldiers that fought in the Civil War. It was on paper, it was on files. They had millions and millions of pages and they had to wait and Nobel Prize winner Bob Fogel was around, involved with the effort until the cost of digitization dropped. But then you saw what happened over a period of time when they had the onset of disease as they got older and older. And so I'm with Sam on this one. The infinite amount of data on every human being that could be loaded in, it's the people that write the apps not just the data ultimately that are going to create this value. The excitement to me, and something that you understand totally, Pradeep, is that we can have 10,000 graduate students, PhDs, MDs, computer scientists, mathematicians, coming up by looking at this data uh, and coming up with ideas and writing programs of how to access this data. I think we all know that there is so much data. The question is, how are you going to analyze it? How are you going to see it? What are you going to do with it? And uh, <clears throat> the former governor of Indiana, Mitch Daniels, was here, who's today the president of Purdue, and they've been working on getting IP into the hands of their students right. down to the freshman level. If you want to work on something, they're going to try to figure out how you can get some IP royalty from it. So I think the key is building the database. And one of the things that, that concerns me is the standardization of that data bank. Because we all understand you know, bad data in, we have an issue. What's the quality of the information is there a standard mechanism of, of what you want loaded, what we need to know, et cetera, if we're going to take a whole bunch of DNA samples of some kind? What are the requirements? How are they done? And over the last 22 to 25 years, we've been very focused on tissue banking, you know, uh, liquid saving of things. How are you going to store them? so that you have quality tissue if you needed it at that time. Obviously today, we are reopening failed two clinical trials by going back and looking at blood samples of those people and searching for mutations that they had in common that has resulted in different drugs being useful today. So I, I, let's think about those apps Right. that are sitting on the data. So you're saying that the uh, sort of <laughs> tidal wave and the volume of data, Mike, is going to overwhelm some of the concerns that we're hearing about in terms of who owns it and how can I control it. That it's, you're saying this sort of unlocking is already happening and it's about to completely be unleashed. Right, and yes? that's what I meant by crowdsourcing discoveries. That's exactly what's going to happen. The smartest people get to work on all okay. this data. So let's talk about the smartest people. and but the, the smartest student didn't have $100 million to create a data set. And so right. the <laughs> ability of creating these data sets will attract the best and brightest. One of the things we had in finance 
was these data sets quite often were free. There's all this information that's being fed in. So if I have an idea, I can go test it. Fidelity in Boston gives you the opportunity that you have an investing theory. Let's put it in there. Here's the data. Let's see how you would have done. And so we're going to attract many of the best and brightest. A lot of the crowdsourcing activities, when you give them data, one of our directors at Faster Cures, Dr. Merkin, who created a prize where it said, can you tell me who's going to be in the hospital in the next year? And can you, I'll give you the data on 150,000 people. You don't have any clue who they are. But can you tell me, and we're going to have a contest here, and I'm going to give you a $3 million prize to the individual. Now, what happened? Less than half the people that competed were in the medical field. You had hedge fund managers, mathematicians, everyone looking through this data. And so the excitement is once we've got this data, yeah. there's no telling who's going to want to analyze it. Yeah. We Michael, can we come that? back to the, the smart students? Because I think it's important to talk about how we're going to educate and fund the education of the next generation of individuals that are going to make precision medicine successful. Currently in the United States, NIH funding to universities and academic health centers has been the foundation of training of MDs, PhDs, postdocs. These students then go on to populate pharma, biotech, venture, uh, and, and really advance the science initiative across the country. And we historically, one of the jewels in our crown is, that, is, is our leading reputation in biomedical research such that students want to come from all over the world to train here in the United States. With the decline in NIH funding, our ability to train this foundation of scientists and physicians in this country is being eroded. And we need to now look at alternate ways to educate our next generation of scientists. And that, I think, is an important conversation we, sh we need to have as we talk about Can precision Can I add to medicine. that basic science? Because I think Absolutely. even though we know a lot about precision medicine, a lot is still yet unknown. And we need to understand the basic biology, the basic biochemistry of the human body. And we still don't have a full grasp of this like we do on uh, inorganic, or sorry, uh, inorganic materials like semiconductors. I, I think that is an incredibly important point that basic science is, is, is essentially the foundation of the whole house mm -hmm. right. precision medicine. And we need to keep uh, building and building and building on that. The, 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 the thousand dollar genome is really the beginning, not, not the end. Mm -hmm. And we need to take it down to the, to the next level of protein cellular networks to, to get at some of the issues that Brian was talking about. And that, I think, will unleash a whole uh, new generation of, of drug targets. But the education thing, I think, is critically important. Um, not just training the physician scientists, but thinking about how we train the frontline clinicians mm -hmm. in ways that they're sufficiently sophisticated when they're on their computer and they get access to this huge knowledge network um, how they interpret it, uh, and importantly, how they interpret it to the patient, uh, is a skill set where we're not teaching in a fundamentally different way today than we did 20 years ago. And I think that's Brian, going to have to change. Can you jump in on that? You talked about yourself as one of the, the parents of precision medicine. Um, how is that interface working right now with the frontline clinician and the patient? Because I think that it's getting closer. We're tightening the gap, but I don't think we're there yet. It, it's getting better. And, but I, I wanted to, come, if you don't mind, I'm going to come back to that. I wanted to, to come in on two, air, two things. First of all, is this issue of basic science. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's run a few marathons, I, I view this as the best you're going to run a marathon is you've got the best base training. And that's what basic science is. The, the higher your peaks are depends on how strong your base is. And unless we invest in that base of basic science, we can't achieve the peaks that we want to. Uh, the other thing that I, that I would say is you've seen the trends in NIH funding. Mm -hmm. And if anyone thinks the federal government's going to change quickly and going to reverse that trend, I suspect they will not. But What's happening is that sometimes states are stepping in. I think Massachusetts stepped in, California stepped in with some huge initiatives. 
Um, we as part of what we're calling our night challenge, which was Phil Knight surprised us all with an announcement that he'd donate. He's the co-founder of Nike, for those of you who don't know him. Um, he would give our Cancer Institute 500 million if we matched it in two years with an equal amount of 500 million. Now, we went to the state, and the state kicked in 200 million. And we went to the state, we went with a message that aren't these the jobs you want to create? Isn't this what you want to be known for? Mm -hmm. And even editorials that came out of East Oregon, which is as far away from Portland as you can get, got on that bandwagon. The vote was 85 to 5. Mm -hmm. So it was Republicans and Democrats, everybody throughout the rural part. And isn't this what we want the United States to be known for? Mm -hmm. And if the federal government's not going to step in, then we're going to have to get industry support and philanthropic support to, to fill in those gaps. Otherwise, we're not going to maintain our preeminence. Just to build on that, and, and Betsy mentioned this uh, a little bit ago, I think the relationship with industry, particularly in this collision between tech and the life sciences, is going to be absolutely critical. And the, the word that, that we are using at UCSF is transformative partnerships. So thinking about those relationships in a very different way, it's not simply let's write a grant to a company and hope they give us money and then sort out a very complicated IP deal. Um, it's let's take your expertise and our expertise and put those two expertises in the same physical space to work on a predefined project in more of a, a commercial project orientation way. So it's, it's kind of the bookend to let's keep going with curiosity driven basic science, which is incredibly important for the future and the foundation. But at the other end, we've got to think as universities, think about uh, our relationship with industry in a fundamentally different way. And uh, there's a great appetite for it. And with the technology piece, we're working with different companies than we traditionally have. It's, it's, it's not the pharma, it's not the biotech, it's the tech. And they're looking for an intro into the health world. And so it's a, it's a very interesting time that I think can, can lead to uh, uh, filling some of these uh, gaps in, in innovation. Mike, do you want to speak briefly about the California experience? It sounds like the states are starting to really accelerate their momentum, looking not just at precision medicine, but science funding. Well, I think, once again, when we look at the value of those jobs, those jobs in this area, we sometimes forget the concept of social capital. And if you look at the county, in the country that's won the most academic decathlons, the high schools, you'll find that those are high schools and the kids are the children of the employees of Amgen. And when you look at the public high schools and schools around the country, you find that they are excellent where you have people working in the biosciences. Here we're talking about individuals who on average on average have one graduate degree, might speak multiple languages, and are instilled in their children the importance of education. So these things build communities. The challenge for California is that if the concept that the most important language of the 20th century were zeros and one, quote, data storage, the most important language of the 21st century might be the decoding of DNAs and proteins, et cetera. And so the leadership role in California in the Silicon Valley quote, environment might shift to other parts of not only the United States, but to the world as they take the leadership in this effort. And so Governor Brown from California will be here today, has put up funding to study this issue to find out what is the role. But it takes leading individuals like Phil Knight in Oregon to provide incentive to point out to the people, you want the right jobs of the future, mm -hmm. okay? We need to incentivize people. And one of the challenges I think we don't understand is really the enormous investment that's made in a PhD MD. Mm -hmm. When we think about it, gosh, I graduated high school, and 15 years later, 15 years I've invested of my life 
in graduate school, PhD programs, MD programs, fellowships, internships, residency, and where is the funding coming for that? I think it might be interesting with all the medical schools, what does it cost the school to educate a student per year versus what do you charge in tuition? And I'd be interested to see what I, I think quarter million dollars a year, is that about the right number? No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's a little too high. It's a hard number to get your arms around, but m most of us across the country would put it in the sixty to $70,000 a year. But that's just the tuition, right? Or no, no, that's no, the, the cost of, of educating. Yeah. Now, if you factor, but I think I think you one, in one infrastructure, one one uh, uh, cost that I think is uh, a very dispiriting uh, statistic in the United States right now is the average age of the first independent yeah. grant from the National Institutes mm -hmm. of Health is 42. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we have to bring that down. We just have to bring that down yeah. uh, into the low 30s. So we have been really that. stressing this issue. Um, and over the last 18 years at Milken Institute Global Conference, just stressing that most Nobel Prizes have been really issued for ideas that people had in their 20s and 30s. Mm -hmm. They might win them when they're 60, but most of those ideas, and not only that, it's not just that the delay in funding, but you've had almost a doubling of management of programs by people over 65. Now, on one side, I'm very happy, <laughs> uh, but we need to find a way to encourage our young people right. in this area. So Mike, uh, Fields Award, which is the Nobel Prize of Mathematics, I think the average age is like 28 or 27 or something really young. <laughs> well, we know Einstein was in his 20s. <laughs> And uh, we know Madame Curie had two Nobel Prizes by the time she got into her early 40s. So. But Michael, you're, you're absolutely right. I think one of the challenges that uh, th we face, uh, the four of us here, is, is we, we attract bright, extraordinarily talented young people to come and train in our institutions. And, and how do we give them the resources and the independence uh, and the freedom uh, and provide a supportive ecosystem uh, for them so that they can really bring their ideas to fruition and, and uh, express themselves. And it, it's when we do partnerships with investors that that really gives us that freedom to, to expand the ecosystem. When we're less dependent upon federal government funding, it really creates more opportunities uh, for us. Now, well, of one of the themes I wanted to, to bring up that came up in our very first panel on Monday morning uh, the, the path to cures, which was a look at the public policy implications of all of these issues, uh, was this cannot be just a problem for the scientific community. And if you're taking one thing away from this panel, I want you to think about how if we ignore the system that we're talking about and the, the powers that are going to come from precision medicine, then we're essentially uh, ignoring humanity. Because this is not just the, the scientists or the physicians or clinicians' problem. It's all of our collective um, problem and opportunity to, to figure this out and do it in a way, Betsy, that you just spoke about, which is really try to bring together all of those different sectors. And right. I think we're more capable now than ever before, yeah. perhaps, because you know we're, we're so, looking down at some uh, tough funding times. So I think as human beings, you know, we've always been challenged with, like, uh, we're excited about big challenges, like conquering space, you know, the deep ocean. And I think conquering biology is something that we have incrementally tried to do, which is why medicine is improving on a daily basis. But we have not quite conquered biology. And I think that could be the ultimate uh, grand challenge that we are after. Absolutely. And given that this decade coming up is the largest intergenerational wealth transfer decade, I think, uh, there's an opportunity for all the wealth that we have all created to be invested back into ourselves uh, to build a stronger basis. Mm -hmm. Pradeep, I think as we think about stem cells, rebuilding our bodies, I think we all want to make sure that we can rebuild our bodies, but what about our brain? And I know this is an area that right. you've spent a lot of time thinking about. I know. So I think brain is the other big uh, unknown, right? So you can imagine genetically you can clone somebody but you cannot create the exact person because the experiences are not captured, the emotions are not captured. 
So one of the things that we've been investing a lot of money at UC San Diego is understanding the brain from the neuro, neuron, neuron level up to cognitive levels. And I think when it comes to precision medicine, focusing on neuro disorders, which are silent killers, every one of us has experienced it, schizophrenia, depression, and so on and so forth, is really ripe for precision medicine. And that would be one of our strategies, one of our big investments that we're making as we speak right now. So, so we're going into our lightning round, which uh, I learned from Cheryl Sandberg and her plenary. I'm going to give each of the panelists an opportunity to give me uh, some perspective on your wish list. So uh, do you want to continue I'll, on? I'll Stephanie? give you two. One is neuro disorders and neuro disease. And the other is what I call the Multiomics Institute to look at genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, microbiome, and sequence the hell out of every one of these things and build this large publicly accessible database. I'm gonna give you one more task, which I did in the, the Monday morning panel, which is what do you want the audience and this kind of body to do? I How want do the audience to invest intellectually, financially, and every which way you can, because I think conquering biology, understanding biology is the next big challenge for mankind, so. Okay. Fantastic, Sam. I, I would like us to, to uh, again, create the, the value statement that attracts the, the incredibly smart uh, people that are going into data science now, into artificial intelligence, into deep learning, but they're going into it in fields like finance, et cetera, to bring them into health. Because we, without that talent pool, um, we can talk about this all day, but we're not going to get there. So we need to bring an entire new generation of uh, data scientists into health and convince them that there's as big a future there as there is in many of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, companies right now. Uh, and then for the, for the audience, I think, is help us uh, develop the language so that everyone understands this as something that is going to elevate everyone's health and is not um, a, a sort of uh, big data threat um, and uh, again, I recognize what Mike said in terms of some of the surveys, but you get a very different reaction if you're sitting there with what you think is a serious cancer and you answer the question versus if you're a healthy 20-year-old and we need the, the data from the healthy 20-year-olds. So we, we need to have a, a public discourse around this so that everyone sees it for what it is and, and we remove the fear from it uh, in order to push the, the field forward. Betsy? As a physician, I want to see precision medicine come into fruition so that all of us as individuals, consumers, and patients can take full advantage of our growing body of medical knowledge to really live healthier, more productive lives. My second wish is a little bit of a selfish one. I really want the United States to maintain its preeminence in biomedical research. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that all of us in this room can do together. So what I would ask of you as an audience is that we engage together as society to really elevate the biomedical sciences and the promise of precision medicine and accomplish this together. But Betsy, I don't hear in what you're saying a, um, a particular flag-waving sort of uh, you know, call to arms. It, is there something unique about the American contribution to the life sciences and biology that we um, really need to make sure we're watching? Well, I, I think that I would love to see the NIH budget double again or to have, have a, a continuous flow, but I, I think that's a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, I really want to call upon the private sector to step up to the plate and to take responsibility for support of the biosciences in this country in a way that we that I know it can and we haven't fully accomplished. We, we've mentioned it a couple of times, but in terms of waving a flag, I, I would like to wave the flag for fundamental basic science one more time okay. because I think as resources get tight, everyone wants them to direct them to what they think is going to be a quick win. Can from I a clinical it? perspective. And we have uh, had a leading position in basic science, and I think that is our biggest threat right now. Brian, we're going to get to you in a minute. Can I tell you what's unique about US? Everybody still wants to come here. This is still the greatest country. Our problem is we took our investments away. Singapore made more investments. A lot of our good scientists went there. UK, a lot of good scientists went there. I think it's all about investments and commitment. That's what is unique about us. Everybody still wants to come here. Brian. Now, I don't want anybody to leave here without recognizing what a critical juncture at time we're at. 
It took us 25 years to identify the target for Gleevec and 15 years to develop a drug. In our clinics, we compress that to nine months using the technologies we're talking about. Sequencing, big data, analytics. This is the time if you want to make an impact on diseases to make an investment because of the technologies that have been developed over the past 20 to 30 years. And we can develop medicines more quickly and treatments more quickly with a basic understanding of biological processes. Sequencing human genomes and all the other technologies are now possible and we need to bring that data to bear on the problems to make rapid advances. And I also want to make it clear that Pradeep kind of mentioned this, this is the time to launch an Apollo project against mm -hmm. biologic diseases. Right. When I talked to my colleagues 15 years ago and, and we'd say, well, we could, do, could we do an Apollo project for cancer? The view was, we don't have a basic understanding. When we went to the moon, we had physics, we had rockets, we had all sorts of things that allowed that to be dreamt and to be possible. Today, we have the technologies that make solving biologic problems possible, and this is the time to invest. And think of the innovations that came out of the Apollo project. The computers, um, microwaves, fr freeze-dried foods, all sorts of remarkable things that have made our lives better Tang. because <laughs> yeah, Tang. yeah. And, I feel but, like that was a quiz question, Mike. Though that Tang didn't come from the Apollo, or did it anyway? We'll but but the reality is is that necessity is the mother of invention, <laughs> and if we set our sights on solving a problem, there's going to be remarkable innovations that will come out of that. That will help all sorts of things that we can't even imagine. So this is the time to invest. This is our moment where we can make, an, make a big impact. So Brian, when you go to the Air and Space Museum and you look at the spacecraft that they used for the Apollo mission, it's a little bit scary because you think, how the heck did they get that thing up there? It looks like tinfoil. Yeah. Do you feel that way in terms of looking back at how you did the work that led to Gleevec and what you could do now? It, it I mean, was, is it just sort of unbounded it was, opportunity? It was, what we did was remarkably primitive. And we just threw some drugs at some cells and saw what killed cancer cells without harming normal cells. And saved a lot of people's lives. Mike. Yes. I think we sometimes do not focus until there's a need for immediate action. And if I think back 40 years when my father had melanoma, so for two years I traveled, there was never a problem I couldn't solve. In 24 months, I discovered I could not move science fast enough that would save my father's life. And so here we really see the future. It's data-driven. It's at our doorstep. The question is, do we have the will? Mm -hmm. Are we willing to uh, put up the financial resources to solve it today so that every single person doesn't say, I wish I would have done something in retrospect. One out of every three presidents has lost a child before their fifth birthday. Mm. Almost every single one of those children would have lived based on today's medical technology. Mm -hmm. So being the most powerful person in the world was not enough to save your own child's life. Today, we have the potential to compress the time that we can solve most of these life-threatening diseases by collecting the data and investing the financial resources. Mm -hmm. This issue you asked, Margaret, what about the United States? The country that's going to have the biggest challenge is China. They have most of the world's smokers. They still have the world's largest population. And they are ramping up their efforts here in bioscience. But the advantage of the United States is not only, as Pradeep tells us, that people want to be here, but it's the existing infrastructure mm -hmm. knowledge that allows us to move quickly and then translate those advances to the rest of the world. When I think about the United States and its greatest gift to the world, it's been many of our advances in medical research. The work in Gleevec solves the problem for a person in Cape Town, Beijing, Melbourne, not just Portland, Oregon. 
And when we step back and just think in all of our lifetimes that at one time a woman had a 90% plus chance of passing AIDS onto their children, and now it's down to 2%, just how it's transformed the entire continent of Sub-Saharan Africa, where two-thirds of everyone who has AIDS is living today, mm -hmm. relatively normal lives. And then what do we see? We see that's the fastest growing part of the world's economy. So Margaret, it seems like I'm gonna turn it to you now. Since last time I checked, you're running faster cures. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. So I think that what we have uh, listened to in this panel has really inspired us to think bigger, broader, more optimistically, and to bring it back to the power of one in terms of what we can all do, but also the importance of one. So Mike just has reaffirmed, I think, the, the role of the patient in all of this, that, that that's why we're doing all of this. Um, and, you know, let's not, let's not let either lack of will, lack of resources, lack of everybody coming together stand in the way of that patient. And I think that, Mike, you uh, gave us all an imperative um, we need to do this for a lot of different people, but let's make our parents proud, right? Because they put us here and they allowed some of the opportunity that all of us are trying to uh, further. But for all of the patients who uh, really are, have not been here for the cure, I think we, we owe it to them as much as the people going forward. Um, so I would like to challenge each of you to engage with us at Faster Cures. We're a center of the Milken Institute. There are a number of ways for you all to engage with our work. Uh, we can keep you informed. It doesn't matter if you're a scientist or not. Uh, we speak English, so <laughs> we will uh, translate all of those scientific concepts through lots of our programs. I'm seeing Dr. Latisse Briggs here, who runs uh, with Melissa Stevens, our philanthropy advisory service work, uh, which really can translate for uh, an individual or a specific disease uh, what's possible today. So thank you to our panelists. Thanks to all of you. And Mike, you're gonna lead us in a great lunch panel, I understand. I, I would say for those that are watching this tonight, a year from now, two years from now, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here, Margaret, and, and that is to get personally involved. You know, for 20 years, I was funding programs. Uh, it was the real change occurred when I got personally involved. And talk to your government leaders make sure they understand they have enormous pressure. But many years ago in the United States, there was this advertisement for oil filters called Fram. And they said, you can pay now or you can pay later. <laughs> and so what we're trying to say to you today, the investment in young scientists, the investment in accelerating science, and helping our country and other countries around the world get their priorities correct will free us up to deal with many other problems. And when I think about it, I think about it's our responsibility. For so many of us, our parents fought, lived through World War II. Tens of millions of them lost their lives so that we can have freedom and other advantages we have today. Our children will have enough challenges in life. One of the things we can give them is eliminating a lot of these life-threatening disease as a challenge in their life. So let's get it done today. Thank you. Thank Mike, you. thank you for thank the you. opportunity.